everyone. It's April Jasper here, and I know that I'm competing with dinner. So hopefully I can keep you here with me and uh, you'll hang out to hear my story. And those of you who know me know that I can't really do a presentation without telling you some stories. So get ready. In the few minutes we have, you get to hear a little bit about my practice. But we're going to talk about corneal hysteresis. And the reason we are is because I truly believe that it is a vital sign for glaucoma diagnosis and management. So what we're going to do here as we get started, we're going to talk about corneal hysteresis and what it is. And then we're going to look at some evidence, because even though it's great to hear me say that it's a fabulous test to be able to have and a, a number to have for your patients, I think it's important that we show you the studies. There's over 900 peer-reviewed publications that talk about it and tell you how, uh, how important it is. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. And then you're in for a treat because we have Dave Taylor with us from Reichert, and he's going to join me as we take questions at the very end. So you don't have to worry that I won't know the answers. We got him here to help me. So here's my why you should stay and listen. And I think this is a big deal because it could happen to you. And so the story goes when I was, let's see, out of, it was right when I left my practice in Tallahassee, I came to West Palm Beach and David and I bought a practice here. It was 2002 to be exact. And I was so excited because the patient base there was phenomenal. The doctor that has had been there had been there for years. The practice had been in existence since 1941. And so I was thrilled when I found out that we had a lot of patients with a lot of needs, such as glaucoma, diabetes. You know, I wanted to be the one to help them. And so everything's going great. I was well-trained, I felt, because I had done internships with some awesome people like Dr. John McSoley and Mark Dunbar at Bascom Palmer. And then I did a residency in Boston at the Brockton West Roxbury VA with some fabulous people as well. And I thought, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm ready to go. And I'm treating patients and doing well. And then six months into this, I get sued. Now, I got sued by a patient who was suing for failure to warn of the diagnosis or failure to warn of the seriousness of the disease glaucoma. And so I can tell you I was devastated. I was so scared. I didn't know what to do. It was a mess. And so in my young, naive state, I decided that what I would do is not take care of glaucoma patients anymore. Sounded like a great idea until everybody started complaining. I was having trouble getting them in to see other doctors. And I was just doing it out of fear. And so I backed up and started thinking about it again. And I said, you know what? I'm not doing this. I'm going to get back in the game. I'm going to do what's right for my patients. And I'm going to learn more so I can protect myself. So I went out. I looked everything up you could possibly look up to know what is the prevalence. 2% of the population has glaucoma. Then I said, well, what about the patients that are undiagnosed? And what are most lawsuits all about? And what I found out is that a majority of lawsuits in eye care revolve around glaucoma. And so I wasn't the first to be sued. A lot of the lawsuits are around failure to diagnose and failure to detect, treat, or refer when patients progress. All right. So now I'm thinking about it. And I thought, well, I've got the data. What am I going to do? What technology do I need to make sure that I'm not in trouble? And so look at the numbers here with me. 50% of glaucoma patients remain undiagnosed and up to 50% of primary open angle glaucoma patients have unmedicated IOPs below 21 in the traditional method of measuring IOP. So now I'm on this journey and I'm thinking, what do I need to bring into my practice in order to protect myself? And so as I got started, all we had were cameras and visual fields. So I made sure I had that. Every year bought a new piece of technology. Then I bought an OCT. And as soon as corneal hysteresis was something that I knew was important, which was very early on, I probably have one of the first that were ever made, I decided it was something that I had to have. And so what do we know about corneal hysteresis? Well, I'm going to give you the end of the story before we go through all the middle, just in case I don't get to that part. What we know is that corneal hysteresis has been shown to be highly associated with and predictive of development of glaucoma and future rates of glaucoma progression. So right there, I had what I needed. I knew that this was something that had to be part of my practice because I want to do what's right for my patients, taking care of them, and I also want to stay out of trouble. There are several studies, and you'll see some of them, that arguably say that it's as important as IOP and more important than corneal thickness. And the other thing I think to keep in mind is that 
The device that measures corneal hysteresis, which is the ocular response analyzer, you're going to see it as ORA or aura throughout this talk, also provides a measurement of IOP that's been shown to be less influenced by corneal properties that negatively impact the accuracy of Goldman. So that's the end of the story. That's why it's important and why it's a vital sign. But let's go through some of the numbers. Let's look at this together so we can see exactly what it is. So as you think of corneal hysteresis, think of that tempur pillow, the tempur mattress that you have, and think of how you make that indentation. I'm doing it with my hand. You can do it too. And then how it responds as you lift your hand. And so as we look at the elements of corneal hysteresis, we have to talk about elasticity, viscosity, and damping. So I love this example. I know this is near and dear to Dave's heart because he's a car guy. So your car suspension has two key components, right? The springs and the shock absorbers. If you have a bouncy ride and your drink is spilling from your cup holder or you're having trouble talking on the phone, then you know it's not the spring that's the problem. It's a bad shock absorber or the damper. And so what you're seeing there is that you can't have that, the energy is not dissipated and stopping the spring from oscillating. So now as we look at it further, and I love this because David Luce is the inventor really of this whole concept of corneal hysteresis and a MIT grad physicist, that's what my son wants to do. He's brilliant in how he came up with the whole idea that corneal hysteresis really could be one of the most important parts of the, of the uh, vital signs for glaucoma. So what is it? It's the cornea's ability to absorb and dissipate energy. And so one of the things I didn't realize until I started down this path of learning more is that there are so many times our eyes are under assault. What does that mean? Well, did you know that when you blink, some people, their pressure goes up as high as 60, as up to 60. And so when we rub our eyes, our pressure goes up. We're under constant assault. Technically, our cornea is. And so hysteresis tells us how good of a shock absorber the eye is. So now let's look at how it works. So corneal hysteresis, as you look at it here, and this kind of demonstrates how this is happening, is the difference between the inward and outward applination events during an ocular response analyzer measurement. So if you look at the graph, you can see what happens as the air puff touches the cornea. So you have the normal cornea, it flattens, you have the indentation, then you have it come back out and back to normal. So we're measuring that difference. And so what is a normal number? Well, the average normal corneal hysteresis is 10 and a half. That standard deviation is one and a half, but it's very stable diurnally and with age. But when you take the measurement and the screen you're seeing on the right is actually what's on the measurement, which what's on the device. And so as you look at that, you can see that the corneal compensated IOP is gonna be on that device. That's the measurement you get with one touch of a button. You get the corneal hysteresis number. Then you get the Goldman equivalent, as you see here, the IOPG, and you get a waveform score, which tells you how accurate it is, which is interpreted similar to how we do the OCT waveform. So let's look at a couple of studies. And I think as we look at these, what's important here is to kind of keep in mind that all of these studies, if you look back at my story, a lot of this information came out after I even had the technology. I can tell you it works and it's been effective just from my clinical practice, but these studies are so important. This one helps, to helps us to understand how the corneal hysteresis actually tells us something about the back of the eye. And you can see the results of the study show that corneal hysteresis is, is reflective of the overall ocular tissue properties. And remember, it, it also teaches us that the eye is a mechanical structural continuum. And so now as we continue in this journey of understanding, let's look at the evidence. So this one is from 2006. We're looking at central corneal thickness and corneal hysteresis as we look at glaucoma damage. And the conclusions of this study tell us that corneal hysteresis was the parameter most associated with progressive visual field worsening. And in this one, you can see this 2015 study we see that corneal hysteresis can actually be used as one of the prognostic factors for progression independent of corneal thickness or IOP. And what about the risk factors, uh, corneal hysteresis as a risk factor for glaucoma progression? You know, that's what going back to my challenge and what I was concerned about with my patients. I want to know how to detect 
if a patient has glaucoma, I also want to understand quickly if they're at higher risk for progression. And so what this study shows us is that it basically supports the role of corneal hysteresis as an important factor to be considered in the assessment of glaucoma progression. And this graph I like a lot because it helps us, and I'll show you later in a case study how, it, how we can use this to better know how to take care of our patients. But it talks about how um, corneal hysteresis is a risk factor for glaucoma progression once again. And you can see here for eyes with lower corneal hysteresis, the impact of IOP is significantly larger than in eyes with higher corneal hysteresis levels. And so the effect of IOP on progression rates was dependent upon corneal hysteresis in this study. And in a couple of case examples, you'll see how this works. And I think you'll find it extremely valuable in clinic. And how about this one? This is about uh, how it's a risk factor again for predicting development of glaucoma. And I promise we're not gonna look at all 900 studies, but I think these are important because this one shows us that each one millimeter lower that corneal hysteresis is was associated with an increase of 21% in the risk of developing glaucoma during follow-up. So as you think about it and you think about, okay, so I'm gonna get this number, April, from this measurement from the ocular response analyzer. Now, what does it tell me and how does it help me to interpret what I'm gonna do with my patients? And so we're gonna talk about it as we go through this, but just think about it this way, the lower that number, the higher their risk. And so it goes into that box of what do I need to know about these patients to know who's at risk for progression and also who's at risk for converting to glaucoma. So here's another one that was interesting. Here we look at the uh, visual field progression in eyes that had seemingly well-controlled intraocular pressure. We all hope we don't have any patients like that because those are the ones that we just don't know what's going on sometimes and what to do about it. But that's where corneal hysteresis comes into play again. Approximately, as you can see in this study, one quarter of eyes with well-controlled IOP may show visual field progression over time, but the thin corneas and low corneal hysteresis are the main risk factors that they found. So now we look at the, this one where you, you're basically looking at corneal hysteresis, and this is a 2022 study, a prospective longitudinal study that looks at corneal hysteresis as a risk factor of central visual field progression in glaucoma. Now we hear a lot, I'm sure you have already about the importance of central visual fields. And so we can look at central, we can look at our typical 24-2 that we're doing. Does corneal hysteresis relate to both of them? And so as you can see here that in multivariable trend-based analysis, lower corneal hysteresis was associated with a faster rate of decline in 10-2. All right, you ready? Let's look at the the final results. And so as we look at corneal hysteresis as a risk factor for central visual field progression, we can see, and I love how the summaries and a lot of these studies are worded and some of the stuff we can pull out of them, which we show you here in quotation marks. These results show that corneal hysteresis is a significant predictor of glaucoma to central and peripheral visual field loss or progression. So we're looking not just at our normal, pro our progressive or peripheral visual field loss, but also that central visual field. So given the substantial influence of central visual field impairment on a patient's quality of life, our findings suggest, they go on to say, that corneal hysteresis should be considered in the risk assessment of disease progression in clinical practice. Wow, you know, I'm glad all of this turned out to be true as I uh, invested in the technology, but we had a lot of research even by the time I did that told us this was gonna be the way to go. And it has been incredible because I can tell you, we use it as our only measurement of IOP. I have Goldman as well, of course, in the rooms, but we love this because it's easy to use even on children. And so every patient that comes through the practice, this is the way we check their pressure. But back to the studies. So what about corneal hysteresis? Is it able to help us predict our patient's response to glaucoma therapy? And I love listening to Dr. Radcliffe talk about this because he's on a couple of the, on the website, on Reichert's website. So go to reichert.com. You'll see some of the videos of these doctors who've been in these studies. 
And he is on there and he talks about the study and the impact that it has and also talks about how he went through and, and was or was able to interpret the data. So what you see here is if you look at baseline corneal hysteresis being down, you can see where it says 11.9. Now you move over and you can see that the IOP percent change was less than someone who has low corneal hysteresis. So now that we know that, how do we move forward? Well, again, having that number is one of the most important things, just starting with corneal hysteresis as a number that's there. But let's look at some cases because you're right, it does matter. And you know, I should go back to my story for just a minute. When I bought the technology, I didn't buy it because I could bill for it. Now there is a code, it's actually, let's look, 92145 that you can bill, but um, it's on the books, but most Medicare regions have actually put the code on the list of non-covered services. So many doctors charge a small fee or um, some of them even just roll it into the exam. What I do in my office is it's my standard way of measuring IOP. So it's part of my practice. And for me, I really felt like it was a necessary part of my practice so that I could be sure that when patients come in and they go through the whole process that we do in our office, I know that there isn't a person that I'm going to miss, and hopefully there isn't a person that I'm not going to notice as we look at progression. So let's look at this case because I think it really helps us to kind of put this all into play. So in this case, this was a patient, and thank you to Dr. Medeiros for sharing this case with us, that had slow progression despite IOP control. All right, so... 62-year-old male with a diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma. He's currently on maximum tolerated medical therapy, has undergone two sessions of laser trabeculoplasty. His vision is good. Biomicroscopy is normal. Look at his Goldman IOPs. They're 10 and 12 on maximum tolerated medical therapy. So pretty good. Corneal thickness, you can see there, not too far off. But now look what's happening with his visual fields. So you can see 2003. And then we move over to 2007, 2010, 2011. He continues to get worse, even though his IOPs are low. But later on, we find out that his corneal hysteresis is 6.1. And so now you throw that on this graph that I showed you earlier. And knowing that this patient has low corneal hysteresis, if we had known that, we would have known that he was more likely to progress. And so in this patient might have helped us to know, go to surgery sooner or add more medications, at least know that we needed to have a lower IOP. So how about this case? This is a high IOP patient who's not responding, but has high corneal hysteresis. So now let's figure out what we should do. Okay, 73 year old Caucasian female, diagnosed with ocular hypertension three years ago by an outside provider. So her sister's also being followed for glaucoma, it turns out, but not being treated. And you can see she's on a few meds. She's taking latanoprost. Her Tmax is 26. Medicated IOP is 21 on multiple visits. Central corneal thickness, you can see, is mm, not too bad. It's higher than average. Corneal hysteresis is good. And so we see a healthy RNFL, cup to disc ratio, not symmetric, no, but there's no dyscheme and they're... Here you see the visual field and the OCT. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Well, honestly, we have a high IOP non-responder, right? But their corneal hysteresis is high. So the question really is, if this patient came to you after being seen at another office, does this patient even need to be treated? And so in this case, what was done is the latanoprost was stopped, pressures were stable at 25 and 26, visual field stayed stable, Optic nerve head is stable and the OCT is stable. So in this patient specifically, it helped us to see that we really don't need to be as concerned when we have all of the vital signs for glaucoma. Now, quickly, in the last few minutes, I promised you we'd talk a little bit about the compensated, the biomechanically compensated IOP measurements because this technology not only measures the corneal hysteresis, but it has actually software that has enabled us to take that number and it translates it into an IOP that we can then use in our records. We know that it's not effective and your EHRs may want to use your central corneal thickness to try to create a new IOP. Don't do it. All the research says that's a big no. 
So what about this IOPCC, which is, again, one of the measurements of the four that you're going to get when you do one test? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to it's a pressure measurement that's less affected by the corneal properties. It correlates and agrees with Goldman on average, has minimal correlation with corneal thickness and corneal biomechanics. And here's a key component. Somebody I know is going to ask this. It changes less after refractive surgery. So that makes this measurement the most accurate you're going to get when measuring IOP after refractive surgery. So here we see the IOPG that this uh, technology gives us agrees with Goldman, but the IOPCC provides an estimate of IOP that's less influenced by those corneal properties. It's also, like I just said, more accurate pre-post LASIK. And you can see here that it had the strongest association with visual field loss versus Goldman or eye care tonometry. And then we look at this. And I have to almost giggle when I see this. And it took me two or three times watching other people talk about corneal hysteresis and listening to them before I stopped being a little offended by this. And let me explain. This is a, a study that looks at whether or not it's more accurate to have your technicians use the ocular response analyzer repeatedly than to compare. And then it compared your tech using it with your with the doctor measuring Goldman. And then it looked at the tech measuring Goldman versus the doctor measuring Goldman. So what did it find? There was only moderate agreement between Goldman IOP measurements obtained by techs and ophthalmologists. Agreement between Aura IOP and ophthalmologists even was better, but the best was technology, go figure, that was repeatable every single time with just the touch of a button. And so the questions even come up, why do we even measure Goldman anymore? And I I love uh, being able to show you this. Aura is clearly better, and it provides more information about who's getting worse, according to the folks in this study. So here's another case that really demonstrates where this stands out and uh, saves us in some cases. In this patient that had fluid under her LASIK flap, she was complaining of blurry vision and pain in her right eye. She had multiple office visits where her pressure measured the normal way with a Goldman tonometer was 15. But then when we measured with Aura, it was 46. And we were able to diagnose her with angle closure glaucoma. And so as we look at the summary here, before I bring Dave on to help me with some of your questions, you can see that the IOPCC reduces the influence of corneal artifacts that negatively impact the accuracy of your Goldman readings. And I think if you look at all of the data, it's important to remember that this enables us to integrate IOPCC readings in comparison to historic other readings. So by that, I mean, doctors sometimes say, well, I've already been doing Goldman all this time. Now, how do I switch to this and not worry that the numbers aren't going to make sense? And so we wanted to make sure you saw the studies to show you that it actually will be more beneficial in your practice. Practically, it's easy to use. This is what it looks like. Again, I've had this for a very long time, more than 15 years. It's simple to operate. Any of my techs have been able to learn it. Everybody knows how to use it in the office. Even children, we measure on it. It gives you that waveform score so you know, uh, zero to 10, about accuracy. You don't have to use drops, no disposables, no costly disposables, and uh, no need for high-level disinfection. And, of course, the values can be exported to your EHR. So, in summary, it's a powerful tool, corneal hysteresis is, to help us to be able to diagnose early, detect progression, and to be able to make sure that we're watching our patients carefully. And we also see that it's more clinically relevant, the IOPCC measurement and estimating IOP than Goldman, and it's easy to use. All right, so Dave, would you mind coming on screen with me? I know we have a few questions and we have about five minutes left. No problem. I think you can probably hear me. I'm not sure if you can see me yet or not, but... um... There is a whole bunch of questions uh, that came in. I think you can see any any that you want to take a stab at, uh, Dr. Jasper. Wow. How about this one? Dave, you answer this one if you don't mind. How does corneal hysteresis change with age? Is there normal data for kids and does it vary by race or refractive error? 
Those are all great questions. And those are some of the things that were looked at really early in the ORA story before we even really understood well what this measurement represented. Uh, the um, hysteresis does change with age ever so slightly. It goes down ever so slightly as we get older, similarly to central corneal thickness, which uh, decreases by about 10 microns a decade as we age. Um, the um, children tend to have much higher hysteresis than adults mm -hmm. do. It kind of drops uh, significantly somewhere in the in the teen years. Um, but but young children have significantly higher hysteresis than adults do. Average in kids is about 12.5 versus a uh, 10.5, which you pointed out earlier in adults. Um, there are racial differences in corneal hysteresis. Um, and, and maybe that partially explains why certain ethnicities are at higher risk of glaucoma. Blacks and Hispanics do tend to have lower hysteresis than Caucasians do, according to the studies that have been done. Um, not a very strong correlation with refractive error, but on the extremes, you know, if you look at a huge um, uh, plot of uh, myopia and hyperopia, there's a big scattergram in the middle, but then at the tails, you'll see some differences. Um, and so there probably is some utility of corneal hysteresis in predicting myopia progression in kids as well, but that those studies have, have not been uh, wow. um, conclusive yet. So Dave, one, I think that I would love to hear you answer. I know I was very concerned when uh, COVID came out, and everybody was talking about NCTs not being good to use because of the aerosolization of the virus. And I was pleased to find out that that wasn't a problem, but do you want to give a further explanation of why? Yeah, I'll cover it briefly. I mean, we could spend a whole webinar talking about that subject. And I never anticipated in my life I was going to have to become a pseudo expert on, on aerosolization, but there we were. Uh, the, the basic uh, summary is that um, there are some old studies that show that NCTs scatter tear film. Those studies were performed with older NCT technology where the air puff was substantially harder, and they put supplemental uh, artificial tears and fluorescein in the eyes in order to wow. document the tear film splatter in those cases. So you had excess tear film, artificial tear, and a harder air puff that definitely scattered um, tear film, and that was captured. Uh, however, it's important to note that a little bit of a tear film scatter from the air puff is not aerosolization. An aerosol is a particle that is smaller than 100 microns and can remain suspended in air. A droplet of tear film, if it ever should scatter from the air puff, falls to the ground immediately. So this is not causing a spray of airborne, possibly virus-laden um, particles in the air. Now, the other question that came up is regarding which of the numbers that are generated by the aura or ORA should uh, be used in your record. So I'll tell them what I do, Dave. You tell them if there's something other doctors are doing different. I use the IOPCC. And so the way I think about it is the IOPCC, as I tried to explain as quickly as I could, it actually takes into account the corneal properties that could be contaminated by, you know, a different factors, and it gives me a more accurate measurement. So that's the measurement I want to see in my record. Having said that, I also want the corneal hysteresis in there. And so as you take the question and answer it, Dave, and if it's any different, also, if you wouldn't mind, tell them about the question Oh, a question that came up is how often should you measure corneal hysteresis more than once in their life or go ahead. I agree with you. I think most uh, clinicians are using the IOPCC measurement because it's basically a Goldman like IOP value that that has less uh, possibility of error in it. So I completely right. agree with that. Um, does it need to be done only one time? Well, it's a fairly static parameter, but since the measurement of hysteresis comes along for free, so to speak, with the IOP measurement, and most users of the ORA are using it for their tonometric device, it certainly doesn't hurt to, to repeat measure it. Um, and then what else? Was there one about LASIK in there? There was. So the question is, how does LASIK affect corneal hysteresis? 
So hysteresis goes down permanently after LASIK, uh, just yeah. like corneal thickness goes down permanently after LASIK. And what that means is that in a post-refractive surgery patient, probably not a good idea to use hysteresis as a as a surrogate for glaucoma risk because right. it's no longer the native tissue of the cornea. Um, but the IOPCC measurement was actually specifically designed for use yeah. on refractive surgery patients. And so that becomes a very powerful tool um, uh, because it gives you a more accurate pressure measurement in a post-refractive surgery eye. I love it. If you guys have questions, Dave Taylor is the director of business development. You can reach him at uh, Riker and uh, Dave, you want to give him your webs or your email address? Well, there, you know, there's so many good questions that came in here. I'm assuming our friends with eyes on glaucoma can copy and paste all these uh, to you and you and I, and we can sort them out and, and, and send everybody answers for the ones we didn't get to, Dr. Jasper. Sounds great. Thank you.